All right, well, thank you very much. Uh, is the volume okay if I hold it this close to my mouth? Okay. Uh, I want to thank the uh, Stantons, Doug and um, Ann, and then Attorney Grant Parsons for starting this National Writer Series and bringing to Traverse City a lot of our favorite authors and then introducing us to a lot of great new authors. And I'd like to thank them for inviting me to be here tonight because I have the best seat in the house. <laughs> so anytime, Doug and Ann, this would be great. Uh, thank you to W. Bruce Cameron for being here. <laughs> Yay! For tonight, is it okay, can I just call you W? <laughs> w. <laughs> Let's not do that. No, you go, you go by Bruce, right? I go by Bruce, yeah. What is the W, uh, what's, the, what's the W stand for? It stands for www.wbrucecameron.com. <laughs> <laughs> it's all there on the web. Um, we're going to talk a lot, uh, Bruce has written a lot of books. He's written, you've written about um, things that you know, fatherhood, dogs, and Ruddy McCann, the repo man of Kalkaska, which is, hey, yeah. sort of autobiographical. We'll get into that. Um, and we'll find out what else might be on tap here. When, when, well, give us uh, your northern Michigan credentials here. Uh, we've heard you were born in Petoskey. Yeah, I don't remember that part, but yeah. Okay. What do, you, what do you remember? Tell us what your connection is to uh, Northern Michigan. Where, I mean, how well, much I time did you spend here? I, when I lived in Traverse City, I was, I, it was 20 or 30 years ago, as the mayor just addressed. Uh, I was a repo man, and none of the people I repossessed were ever bored. Not a single one of them. <laughs> and, and by the way, if there's any of you here in the audience tonight, it's good to see you again. <laughs> I hope we can put that all behind us now. By the way, the key to the city, just so you know, uh, we have a lot of traffic at this time of the year. If you want to go drive on the sidewalk, the wrong side of the road, yeah. and speed, just w you, the police come by, just wave the key, I, <laughs> and you're safe. All right, we'll see okay, how it yeah. goes. All right, so, but you were born in Petoskey. Ray, uh, how many years in Petoskey? Well, I don't know. You don't I mean, know. I was a little kid. Well, so you uh, moved away when you were a little yeah, kid. Yeah, we moved away, but, but uh, yes, but my Holy uh, Island for how many years? Holy Island forever. Forever. Uh, my grandparents bought a place that was built in the 20s on uh, Holy Island. How many people know where Holy Island is? All right, good for you. Uh, most of you have no idea. And that's okay because it's this tiny little uh, spit of an island between East Jordan and Charlevoix on the south arm of Lake Charlevoix. And I spent every summer of my life there and have been up here every summer of my life since. Have you written any uh, part of your uh, published books on Holy Island? I have written uh, most of my unpublished books on <laughs> Holy Island. Maybe we'll find out about that too. <clears throat> At what point did Bruce, W. Bruce Cameron know or suspect or have the desire that you wanted to be a writer? I don't remember not wanting to be a writer. I always wanted to do it. And it's funny because, you know, when I was a little boy, everybody wanted to be an astronaut or uh, a baseball player. Uh, one guy I knew wanted to be a professional dancer. Uh, <laughs> and that's, uh, and oddly, he's the only one, by the way, who got, n n none <laughs> of my other uh, classmates were astronauts or ball players, but he's still a professional dancer, so. <laughs> Uh, but I wanted to be a writer. That's all I wanted to be. That's all I can ever remember wanting to do. So what does that feel like? Uh, I mean, uh, uh, writers have keen senses of observation. You might be the guy that's standing there quiet or sitting quietly looking at everybody else, forming ideas and notes. Was, was that you? I was looking at girls. Girls, okay. Trying to figure them out, and I'm still, I still don't understand. All right. Now, um, where did you move out of, out of Petoskey? Back to Denver or out west? Oh, uh, my dad was a professor of medicine at the University of Kansas Medical Center in Kansas City. So uh, went to high school there, uh, went to college in Missouri. Uh, then I moved back to Michigan, and I, and, and I moved to Traverse City to become a, a repo man because that just seemed like a really logical career <laughs> move. <laughs> and, uh, and I lived mostly in Michigan then uh, until I moved out to Colorado uh, in the late 80s, and then uh, from there I moved to Los Angeles. When did you become a writer then? When, after all these years of uh, wanting to be a writer and repossessing cars and other odd jobs, did you actually uh, get a paying gig? Oh, a paying gig. I, paying sold my first, gig. I sold my first story, the first one I ever wrote uh, at age 16. And uh, let me tell you, it was the worst thing that could have happened to me because I, was, I concluded, oh, this is going to be easy. 
I, I, do I need to go to college? I'll just write a bestseller, you know? I thought that, like that. Uh, doesn't, it didn't happen that way. Uh, was there pressure from your parents at all? I mean, kid says, I want to be a writer. Or did they say, no, you, you want to be a doctor or a lawyer or a banker? Did, did they uh, discourage you? Uh, I think my you? dad would have loved for me to have gone into the medical profession, but then when I was uh, four years old, I stuck a pee up my nose and had to go to the emergency room, and I did it three times in one week. And I think he concluded after that, and it's not going to be, I'm not going to be a doctor. Be a writer. All right, let's see. Um, you started in 1995, and in 1995, I remember somebody told me about this concept of email, and that's how new it was. You started an internet blog in 1990. Well, not, they didn't call it a blog. You started an a internet column back then. Is that right? Yeah, that's exactly. I couldn't get published anyway, so I thought I'll just publish myself with this new thing called email. And back then, you did not get uh, anything offering to enhance your mail virility or yeah. messages from, <laughs> from gentlemen in Nicaragua who or Nigeria who have $10 million that they want to transfer. That didn't happen. So and That's not real? That's... No. Yeah. Poor, poor Ron. Yeah. So, I, so I started this newsletter, and I started sending this thing around to people. And back then, it was kind of exciting to get email, if you can believe such a thing. I mean, people would be, you know, Mom, I got an email. Oh, I'm so <laughs> proud of you, son. And, uh, and there was this thing, the Cameron Column. And it, it, at its peak, it had uh, 50,000 subscribers in 52 countries, if you count Texas as a country. 50. <laughs> and that was how uh, soon after 1995? That's pretty That's, good, 50,000. You know, I'm, I'm having trouble tracking the That's years now. That's before Facebook, before you could promote yourself? Yes. Yeah, there was, yeah. yeah, there was none of that. All right. So, and, and did you get paid for that, or was that a freebie? That was free. That was yeah. a freebie, just so you could write, so you could write to an audience. Yes. All right. Um, well, the question all writers love, we'll get to it now. How is it that you write? Do you write every day? Do you, do you sit down with a legal pad? Do you uh, have a laptop? A ta How do you write? And how did you write back then? Is it different? Well, yeah. So I get up in the morning, and I immediately, the best thing to do as a writer is to start procrastinating immediately. <laughs> uh, I usually, yeah, I usually don't start the self-loathing until after lunch. <laughs> then, then, and I'm exhausted by that point, so I always take a nap. Uh, once I've had a nap, I just don't feel like writing, so, and that's pretty much my process. That's how that goes. So it wasn't that long after 1995. I don't know. I had a call from um, Mrs. Cameron, Monsey, and she said, you know, my son Bruce is going to be in northern Michigan this summer, and he has a new book, and you should interview him. And I got a lot of those calls for the first few years. Was she on your payroll, or how did, how did that work out exactly? My mother sells 1.2 books for every one person she meets. <laughs> And if there's anybody here who has never bought one of my books, I want you to meet my mother. And then you'll buy at least two of them. So she's, she absolutely, uh, the way I remember it is that she called you repeatedly. And that you finally said, okay, okay. if you will stop calling me, I'll let your son be on my show. And, and <clears throat> it's been just about every summer. I mean, how many books do you have published now? I have 16. <clears throat> 16 books. The first one, I believe, was Eight Simple Rules for Dating My Teenage Daughter. And I, I was excited because I had read that this new show was coming out with John Ritter and uh, Rockford, uh, James Garner, Katie Seagal. And I said, you mean the guy who wrote the book that that was based on? Back that was based on a column. So tell us how that came about, a newspaper column that wound up being a, a if not a top 10, certainly a top 20 TV show. It just turned out that it, um, I, <laughs> it turns out that my whole career is based on stating the obvious. It's pretty obvious that, that fathers have a bit of a difficulty adjusting to the, the idea that their daughters might start dating. Uh, and it's something that they feel, fathers feel like they can control, which is <laughs> not possible. So, but I was just thinking about what would the rules be uh, if, the, if, I could, if I could say, these are the rules for dating my teenage daughter, and I wrote that column, and it went, uh, there was no virility in terms of virality, in terms of things going out there uh, on the internet, but it did that in the newspapers. It got picked up by newspapers all over, not just the country, but all over, all over the world. 
And so I knew I had something. I knew I had a, a, a hot idea. Did, did you uh, promote that then and, and seek a book contract or a TV show, or did people hunt you down? How did, all, how did it all uh, I did unfold? have an agent. I lived in Denver at the time, and I had an agent, and she, she took it to uh, a bunch of publishers, and one of them picked it up. Let's do a book. Let's do a book on this. Yeah. And then the TV show, uh, they, TV they show. came knocking on your door, or did the agent pursue that? No, that was, that was an email that just arrived out of the blue. Uh, a guy uh, that worked for Disney, Disney uh, on the movie side, picked up my book in the airport, and uh, then his flight got canceled. And because his flight got canceled, he read my book, and he wrote me an email and said, have you ever thought of turning this into a movie? And I wrote, that's the plan. <laughs> <laughs> what am I going to say? No. <laughs> so uh, they hired me to write the screenplay, uh, and then they also uh, subsequently developed it as a TV show. So, but, but there was no movie, right? No. I, at one point, we were going to do something that had never been done, which is to have a movie come out based on a TV show that was currently on the air. But then, uh, but then John died, and, yeah. and uh, that changed everything. Um, and that was a great show. It's amazing what writers do in 22 minutes, which is how long a sitcom is, uh, to develop a theme and, and, and move the uh, viewer and close it all down, plus yeah, you, a lot of laughs. You write the opening joke, and then it's like, well, we better start winding this up. <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah. Uh, did you meet uh, Ritter during that process? Yeah, yeah. What, I met John, what kind of guy was he? Oh, uh, what a, I mean, this, this is, you know, uh, there are people on television that uh, appear on television to be very nice people, and then when you meet them in real life, you realize that they're just terrible people. I'm sure there's uh, plenty of morning Names. DJs that are like that as well. <laughs> John, uh, John Ritter was the nicest guy, and when he, we were taping the pilot, and he came out onto the floor to ask a, the director a question, and the audience had already been seated, and the audience burst into applause, and the look he gave at the audience was, you're applauding for me? And this is a guy that, you know, he'd had a hit TV show for years, is very famous, and, and, uh, and yet he was so genuine, he just couldn't believe people would spontaneously applaud for his arrival on stage. And he died, and normally that would be the end of the show, yet it carried on. I think they moved um, Garner, uh, was grandpa, and they moved him into a, a more of a prominent role. So that said a lot about the idea, I think, there. Yeah, it was, it was a very popular show, and even after, and, the, and then uh, they, they canceled it after the first year without John because they, uh, they just couldn't, they couldn't understand how they could ever sell it in the syndication because it basically was two shows, one with a dad and one without a dad. Although it turned out, that they did sell it into syndication, and it has been running uh, all over the world ever since. It's still running to this day. I think it's in 20 countries right now. Some of them running it twice. So uh, twice I'm always curious about the economics without personal details, but do you benefit from that if a show is still running as the guy that had the concept? I personally got $5 trillion. <laughs> I, I, uh, I did not benefit from it. Really? Uh, no, I didn't. So. so you're the guy that had the brainstorm and they used that? Did, did you... Do you have uh, to keep rubbing this in? I didn't get any money, okay? <laughs> let's, let's move on. You need a new agent there. Well, how did that change your life, though, going from an unknown... No, from a little... From a, from a columnist in Kansas, or co were you Colorado at that time? I was in Denver, yeah. Denver. Uh, and now you get this column that's all over the world, and they want to make a movie, they make a television show, it's John Ritter, it's primetime... Uh, you're doing interviews with people like me all over the country? <laughs> now, how did that change your life then, as far as the exposure? And what, what was it like? Did you promote? Did you have to do a lot of interviews? I and, became, and was your mom's life changed? I became an, yeah. I became an utter stuck-up bastard. <laughs> yeah, it happens to the best of them. Um, Oliver North. So you did media, though. I understand. Did you go on the Oliver North had some type of uh, radio show? Yeah. Uh, so Oliver North, uh, what, what happened with Eight Simple Rules, uh, and, and you can kind of understand how this happens in the world of the Internet. It was so new, and you'd get something passed along to you. And if you're like most people, you're accustomed to, to hearing a joke and then telling the joke, and it doesn't feel like you've taken any intellectual property. You heard a joke and you repeated it. A column, I would think is long enough that you'd recognize it's not a joke. It's, it's actually, a, a, it's an essay. But still people would take my, my column, put their name on it, and pass it around as something that they had written. Uh, and one day I get an email from a fan who said, hey, did you know that Oliver North has Oliver North's eight simple rules for dating his teenage daughter? 
So I went, sure enough, I saw that. So I thought, well, what am I going to do about this? So I wrote uh, him an email. I said, you know, dear Colonel, all due respect, uh, but um, that's my, my column. So he sent seven members of the SEAL Team 6 Force, <laughs> and they opened fire on my house. So what happened, though, is uh, I get a call from Oliver North. And he, to apologize, he said, I'm so sorry. He explained how it happened, that they, people are just grabbing stuff off the internet and putting it up there with his name on it. And he said, I'd like to make it up to you. Would you like to be on my syndicated radio show on Father's Day? And I said, that was the plan. <laughs> so uh, yeah, so he had me on, the, he had me on his show. And, and uh, as a result, during commercials, most, most uh, radio guys, when there's a commercial, uh, it's, all you hear is silence. They put you on hold. Uh, Ron Jolly always takes a belt of vodka. So, <laughs> uh, so I, was, I was on hold, and, and Oliver North stayed with me, and he, he chatted with me, which I thought was really high class. And at some point, he said, why aren't you syndicated? And I said, I don't know. Uh, that was always the plan. <laughs> and... Uh, he said, I'll, I'll call the head of creators for you. And I said, you know, sure, thank you. And then he did. He called, so I get a call from the head of creative syndicate saying, well, Oliver North just called me. And, uh, and it's wise to do whatever Oliver North asks. <laughs> and he said, uh, so I'd like to read some of your columns and see if they would work here. And that's how I got nationally syndicated. So I, I, I think your desire, or being a... Knowing what you wanted to do and being true to that desire and then working at it uh, through a series of odd jobs, uh, right place, right time. I guess persistence pays off. Are you saying repossessing cars is odd in any way? <laughs> yeah. How many uh, former repossessors do we have out there? All right, uh, let's talk dogs. How many people read or saw a dog's purpose? By applause. I believe we're, we're uh, going to be broadcast, so by How many people cried? How many men cried? I, I mean, uh, how many men like motorcycles? No. Uh, yeah. All right. Uh, so why dogs? Now, you, you went from this whole gig. You were the, the father guy, the father of a teenage daughter, and, and you had that going. And then dogs. What was the first dog book? First dog book was a dog's, a dog's purpose. purpose. Yeah. All right. Um, How'd that come to be? Well, remember the formula: always write about the obvious. People like dogs. <laughs> uh, what, what happened was I was driving up the coast of California with uh, my girlfriend of the time, uh, and she had lost her dog uh, tragically and early, and it had been her first dog. She never had a do dog as a child, and you know what happens. Uh, you just are not prepared for how, how much it's going to hurt. And she turns to me and says, I will never have another dog. And this was really bad news to me because I was starting to feature this, this woman in, in, uh, in my future plans, if you will. So um, sometimes when I want to make a point, I'll tell a story. And I told her a story about a reincarnating dog who remembers each life and uh, keeps coming back to the conclusion that it must have a purpose. And, um, and it did make her feel better about getting another dog. She liked the story so much she married me. <laughs> and, and we do have a dog named Tucker. And uh, Tucker is 24 pounds of uh, suspect DNA. Um, <laughs> And uh, so, and I have heard from, uh, heard from a lot of people that uh, s reading a dog's purpose somehow helped get past that, that very bad day and that we all, they, we all face when we adopt a dog. So um, I'm very gratified with the, the success, but it's, it's funny that it started just with the intention of helping someone uh, cope with grief. See, I read that book. Oh, I saw the movie first, then I read the book. Then I read the new one, The Dog's Way Home, which is outstanding. And uh, Dog Master, I read that. And, and I thought at some point, I understand my dogs. I walk by my dog. I know what they're thinking now. <laughs> because you've become the voice of the dog. Uh, is that what you, you... I mean, there are a lot of dog books out there. We went through a phase with Marley and me. We had a lot of dog books out there. Mark Levin, anybody who was anybody kind of popped out a dog book. Uh, obviously, they didn't do as well as yours. So uh, yours, I think, is the only one that's narrated by the actual dog. Is that the uh, 
secret sauce, or what, how do you explain the huge success? Yeah, well, mostly Tucker dictated that book to me, so I, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I the, the secret, yeah, I think that uh, one of the ways this A Dog's Purpose works, and the, and the sequel is called A Dog's Journey, and they're, they're both for sale here tonight, by the way, and <laughs> that's not the last time you're going to hear that. Um, the, the secret is that the, the, it's told from a dog's point of view, and it's a real dog. So the dog doesn't really, the, there are dog books where the dogs understand each other, and they understand what the people are saying, and they talk to birds and squirrels and things like that. My dog doesn't talk to squirrels. My dog uh, is afraid of cats. My dog runs from plastic bags. So my dog is maybe not that bright. And uh, so my dog just doesn't understand what's going on. Uh, and, but yet these dogs, they're, they're, the joy with which they greet the world is amazing. Right? And their forgiveness, there's a, there's a joke out there right now that I really like, which, is, which says, lock your wife and your dog in your trunk for four hours, <laughs> then go back and open it up and see which one's happy to see you. <laughs> so, have you tried that? No. No. Um, what is the appeal? I, I mean, like your newest book came out. Uh, I was excited because I knew you were coming here. I didn't know about the new book. I walked into Horizon one day and I said, look, there's a, what timing? Yeah. Beautiful. This was booked months ago. It was wonderful. And I read the, uh, A Dog's Way Home and I knew from the description, the dog and his owner are going to be heartbreakingly separated. And I knew they would be reunited. And yet, I turned those pages. I couldn't wait to, to go through. So what, do you have any thought about what is the appeal? I mean, is it, is, is, why do we love dogs? Or why do we get attached to your stories? You know, the dog is in peril. And you know, we're, we're scared. And, and we're pretty sure he's going to be saved. Or we're, so, we're just so happy when they're reunited and something good. What, have you analyzed that at all? Yeah, I mean, at the, at the <laughs> risk of selling my book, the Dog Master, which is for sale here tonight. <laughs> the Dog Master tells the story of uh, the very first wolf to make uh, intimate contact and become domesticated with, the very, with, with people. Um, the secret sauce to our survival as a species, I am convinced, is that we adopted this disruptive technology. We had the wolf. So at a time when the ice was storming out of the north to coat the world for the last ice age and uh, huge, frightening predators were stalking the planet. And we were competing with a Neanderthal force uh, for resources. And the wolves were not our friends. To the wolves, we were a, a weak, helpless, uh, but tasty uh, <laughs> source of lunch. Um, at that time, we adopted this technology. And the dog master envisions what must have happened for that all to have happened. And then take it a step further and envision that if, if dogs, if you had these wild dogs that were becoming domesticated and they didn't like people, we wouldn't let them reproduce. And then also picture that if you're a person and you really like these wolves, you have a better chance of survival yourself. So if Darwin were here, um, he, he went to high school with Darwin. If, <laughs> if, if Darwin were here, he would tell you that this, this, this symbiotic relationship means we both evolve to be with each other. And that's why we love dogs so instinctively and they love us so much, is because we're literally entwined in our destinies. Where? Yeah. <laughs> now, the uh, Dog Master is a terrific book. As I read that, I knew all the research you put into it, and I thought, this is nonfiction. This is fascinating. And I had to keep reminding myself it's fiction based on an awful lot of research. What, uh, give us an idea of what kind of research you did to come up with the, uh, how, how long ago was that? that, you, that, that a this few years ago, yeah. How but many years ago? A few, 30,000. A few years ago. 30,000 years ago. 30,000 years, 30, 30, years ago. Yeah. All right, so uh, is it fairly realistic, do you think? You're, you're oh, yeah, I watched a lot of video from that era. Okay, well, that's, uh, that's, that's uh, what kind of research did you do to, uh, other than video, to, uh, to come up with this uh, Yeah, idea? you know, there's a lot of books about uh, the era. There's, it, it, and it's, what's really interesting is uh, if there's, is there a paleontologist in the house? 
Uh, if you're a paleontologist, you, you're probably aware of the fact that all the stuff that the, that the common folk, that, that we, you know, casual readers think is absolutely settled science is actually very controversial. There's all kinds of competing theories, and certainly my theory that it was the wolf who uh, enabled us to survive as a species. That's not unique to me, although when I made it up, it was. I, I later ran across other people who had either copied it from me, which is the most likely, th even though th their books were published before this. So um, uh, uh, the, the, I guess the, the, the bottom line to it is that I read a lot of those books, and, but, but you have to go to your imagination. If you're going to do a book about the Paleolithic, and you're trying to picture what these people are like. And uh, you know that the, the tallest men on the planet were probably the size of my mom, uh, uh, who's standing up right now because she, <laughs> she can't see otherwise. So uh, when, you, when you know that uh, and, you're, and you're picturing these creatures, including a bear who literally could reach its paw up and bat at those lights, they were huge and they ran at 45 miles an hour. And if you, so if you saw one across the field, you might as well lie down. Your last thought would be, wow, that is a really big ass bear. <laughs> so I had to imagine that. So it comes from mostly from the imagination. How about the, the social uh, order of the humans of that time? You had a couple of different, well, three or four different clans in the book. Some were friendly, some were enemies, some were violent, some were predators. Uh, but they had this structure where uh, the women's council and all the, the women would get together and decide who would mate. Uh, they would choose what male would uh, mate with uh, which female. And uh, they, that's they, how they did in junior high school. That's where I got, <laughs> that's where I got that. And they had a social order. The, uh, the men were the hunter-gatherers. The women uh, prepared the food and, and did things like that. W is that pretty accurate, or, or, or that, we were, that their society was like that 30,000 years ago? We don't have any way of knowing that. What we do know, though, is that people lived in very small tribes because there just weren't enough of us to fill a, even a decent-sized football stadium. I mean, as a species, we were, we were on the brink of extinction. And so our clans were, were tiny. I mean, this would, this would be a huge village back then. There wouldn't be this many people. For one thing, there's no way to marshal the resources to, to feed this many people. They would have to break off into smaller bands. We were nomadic. We, weren't, we hadn't domesticated anything yet, uh, plants nor animals. So uh, what, what then I imagine was if you've got an insular group of 15 to 30 people, they would eventually evolve customs, language, uh, religion that was different than the group of humans on the other side of the river. And that is what happens with the dog master. I envisioned one tribe as being run by women. It's a, it's a matriarchal society. Another one worships the wolf. And so all they are focused on is what would the wolf do in this situation? And, and uh, as you said, there's other tribes as well. So. Um, uh, it's a it's a flight of the imagination because we just don't know. But I hope I I hope I just by accident stumbled across maybe some of the truth. Dogmaster. Now is that on sale here tonight? I believe you're right. Oh hey. <laughs> All right. We will uh, th talk about the new book, A Dog's Way Home. We'll talk about the Repo series and see what else. But if we could get a little glimpse into Hollywood, because. Uh, You've had a lot, well, a lot of experience there in Hollywood. A couple of movies, or three movies, really. One, one's in production, um, a TV show. A Dog's Purpose, the book comes out, New York Times bestseller, zooms to the top of the list there. And uh, what happened then? Did you go and pitch this somewhere? Did you have an agent? Did a studio come calling to you? How did that turn out? How did that come to be? Yeah, I wish I could say that I'm a master of that whole universe, but the, but the truth is that, uh, you know, just, just one TV show under my belt, and frankly, I wasn't involved with a TV show very much until the final season, so I, I didn't really have, like, a high-powered agent, and I didn't really have much going on. Uh, what I did have was a friend named Gavin Pallone, who was a producer. He did Zombieland. Uh, he did Premium Rush. He's, he's made movies. He's made TV shows. And uh, I sent him the book, actually, to be entirely accurate, he was Catherine Michon, my wife's uh, friend, and she sent him the book and said, you really need to take a look at this, and he fell instantly in love with it. Mm -hmm. And then we took it around and we pitched it around town, and we had a couple of interested um, 
studios and one of them was DreamWorks. Now they call themselves Amblin. And uh, they called him the moment we walked out of the meeting and said, don't go see anybody else. We want this. And uh, that's how we sold it. But that was a long time ago. <laughs> that was uh, 2005. And uh, the movie just came out. Was it 2005? 2010, sorry. It was 2010, and the movie just came out. So uh, it, that's how that happens. I, I can't tell you how many authors I've talked to or read about that had their books optioned, and it goes nowhere. Option for a movie. And this one actually got yeah, made. Yeah, this one actually got no. made. It was really it was fun. It, what was, it's really fun is I was in a theater the other day, and the movie was playing, and I saw down in the front row there was a woman that had a, a dog. And the dog is watching the movie. <laughs> And really seemed to enjoy it. <laughs> and I went down to her after the movie was over. I went down to her and I said, my gosh, your dog loved that movie. I, I was amazed. It's just, I'm amazed too. He, he really didn't care for the book. <laughs> Where's the drummer? <laughs> so um, the movie, I think the production budget was, uh, what, 22 mil? 22, yeah. And they spent most of that for me. Most of that was yeah, for, straight in my pocket. And they spent um, a couple hundred bucks on promotion. Yeah, a couple, about two, that. three hundred dollars yeah. on yeah. advertising. And then it went to uh, the movie screens, and it did like sixty, what, four million? Yes. So if you do the math, that's not bad. But then it went overseas, and it's done a total gross of a hundred and ninety some million dollars. Yeah. So <laughs> that was. After you had been on WTCM with me, I just want to point that out. I mean, that, that was the true. plan. That is true. That was the plan. Well, I, you saw the, the weird thing is you saw the version of the trailer that doesn't start as announced by Ron Jolly at <laughs> WTCM in Traverse City. All right. Um, so what happens to Bruce Cameron, though, mild-mannered Petoskey native, just writing a newspaper column, hit TV show, New York Times bestseller, now Hollywood wants to make a movie out of the book. Now it's a huge box office success. Money talks. So are you a bankable guy now? Can you go in to talk to one of these top guys and say, Manny, I've got an idea. Listen to this. Can you get a meeting? Can you get things done? Are you a, are you a mover? A it's, shaker? It's really cute that you think anyone's named Manny yeah, anymore. Yeah, okay, <laughs> Uh, yeah, I'm here to Jerry. tell. I, I, I will tell you that we, I can get a meeting now. I can, I can get a meeting with a studio if I've got something I want to talk about. That'll happen. And, uh, but it's, I can't, uh, am I a mover and shaker? I don't know. I'm, I'm moving and I'm shaking. I don't know. The new book, uh, I mean, it has movie written all over it. So what's the, uh, any nibbles there to uh, get a dog's way home made into a movie? Yeah, we, we have uh, been out with the, the screenplay, and we're, we're getting a lot of interest. It's a very cinematic story, and it's on sale tonight. Uh, <laughs> it's a very... It, because, because picture this dog, Bella. This dog, Bella, is uh, part pit bull and is living in Denver. And in Denver, they have this odd rule that if three animal control officers say a dog is a pit bull, then it's a pit bull. And it could be a dachshund. But if they say it's a pit bull, it's a pit bull. And if it's a pit bull, and if it's, it, it'll be picked up once and they'll tag it as a pit bull, if it's picked up a second time, they euthanize it. And there's no appeal through the system. All you can do is go to court. And then while you're in court, your dog is in the shelter and you have to pay all that money to lawyers and all of that to get your dog out of, out of jail. So uh, Bella's owner, Bella is picked up by an animal control officer. They decide Bella is a pit. Uh, all that Lucas, the owner, can think to do with Bella is to send her into the system, get her with a foster family while he tries to find an apartment outside of Denver, which is a little difficult for him to do for reasons that are explained in the book. Bella decides that a horrible mistake has been made, and uh, she's going to rectify that by going home. So she escapes, and she heads home through uh, hundreds of miles of Colorado wilderness through the Rocky Mountains, a journey that will take her several years and, and through several adventures. Uh, it's, and it's a really, though, um, it's, a, it's a book about the bond between us and our dogs and how our dogs always have us at the center of their hearts. And if they can, they will find their way back to us. 
There are, have there been stories uh, similar to that? I mean, I see in the news every now and then you read about a cat that went across the country or a dog. Have you heard of s true stories like that? Yeah, there are lots of true stories like oh. that. I mean, it, and and we don't know how they do it. Uh, we know that a dog's nose is the most amazing instrument uh, that, that you can imagine. A lot of people try to liken it to sight because we see, and so we think, well, if we could see as well as a dog could smell, we could see mane. Uh, <laughs> I don't know why we'd want to look that way, but... Uh, um, so uh, that's really confusing, though. A much better way is to picture that uh, you have the, the hearing that is commensurate to... or uh, com uh, comparative to a dog's sense of smell. If you had the kind of hearing they have, you, you could hear a whisper uh, from one state away. That doesn't mean you'd be able to pick it out, though. I mean, I think that's part of what happens with dogs, is they have so much information coming in through this primary instrument that, that to sort it out must take some, some real doing. But, but we do think that dogs may have a sense of smell of, of where they live, and they can just sort of home in on that. We also think that, that dogs might have a compass, an inner compass, a sense of the true north. Although I've got a, a compass on my car, and all it does is tell me what direction I'm getting lost in. <laughs> so in the uh, new book, uh, A Dog's Way Home, which, now is that on sale here tonight? I don't know. Okay. I had no idea. They have uh, this dog, uh, Bella, thank you. Bella is raised by cats. Bella lives under a, a porch of an abandoned building with a family of cats, and the biggest cat uh, he calls his mother. And uh, while he's out in the mountains, I don't want to give a lot away, but he pales around with a cougar or a mountain lion for a little while, a baby mountain lion. Is that realistic based on your research? Would two species like that hang out with each other and sleep together for warmth and um, feed each other, help with food? It's realistic based on Facebook. Well, I mean, um, like, at least once a day, someone sends me, you know, it's like an ostrich living with an alligator, <laughs> and I'm like, okay. But would a, would a dog live, or would a mountain, uh, baby mountain lion curl up with a dog? You know, uh, uh, have you baby tried that? Baby, oh, I haven't tried that. Uh, but baby animals will, will snuggle up to almost anything except for morning uh, DJs. They, they, they <laughs> They have a real instinct against that. All right. Um, when you write your books, do you cry? Yes. Bruce? Uh, I, I, no. have, I have written myself into tears, yeah. 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 That has to be, see, that's why, you know, to be a talented writer, I mean, to, know, to, to evoke emotion from people, you have to put the right words in the right order. S sounds so easy, but you're able to do that. But it, it has that impact on you. I mean, you can tell if you're getting it right. Well, I've tried putting them in the wrong order. Yeah. It's just not as effective. <laughs> You've got to get the right order. Yes. If you want to get a movie deal, I well mean, said, that's yeah. one of the first things there. All right. Hey, back to Hollywood, though. Uh, I had a chance to talk to you yesterday, though. And it's, this summer, it's Cars 3. It's Guardians of the Galaxy 2. Shrek's probably in there. Spider-Man's coming out. Fast and Furious 8, Fast 9, and, and 10. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, that seems to be what the money goes into. How do you explain the fact that uh, they made your movie, and what's the th what is the current thought of executives in Hollywood? What are they looking for? It's so cute that you think executives in Hollywood think. <laughs> <laughs> Just, uh, the, the, yeah. <laughs> There's so much going on in Hollywood, it's really easily explainable. Much smarter people than, than I have remarked on the fact that the only really reliable group of movie go goers is teenage boys. Like, you know if you blow up enough stuff, they're going to show up, right? <laughs> so if you think about the quality of movies, you realize, well, that's, that's because they're so afraid of taking a risk, and if they know if they just blow some stuff up, and especially if it's based on another movie where stuff got blown up, they're, they're going to get a crowd in there, they're going to sell the movie. And so that's really, like, the, the paramount thing is they don't want to be the one who made a movie of, say, the life of Ron Jolly, and then nobody came. And they're like, <laughs> if only we had blown him up, you know? So they like a, a good, uh, a well-known, established um, story. Yeah, they're not willing to take a risk, at, but... This, this was an attractive project, this A Dog's Purpose, because it could be made for a price, and people like dogs. The script was really well written, and uh, DreamWorks 
has had a lot of really expensive flops. And they needed to have a, a movie that would come out that would just put some money in the cash register. And this looked like that kind of movie. They didn't know it was going to be as big as it is, but they thought it would at least make some profit. And they needed, you know, they had BFG. They needed some profit after that debacle. Um, the obvious, which may come up in Q&A, so I'll just get to it now. Uh, when that movie came out, all of us who knew about it anticipated that movie. Was so excited. I predicted a huge success for that. Just a great story. And they had good actors and a uh, good director. And then uh, somebody released this video and claimed that one of the dogs on the set was, um, was abused or not looking, uh, looked after properly. What, how did that impact you? How did you deal with it? And did that story impact the movie in any way? Yeah, I awoke uh, the morning that the story broke. I, I awoke from uh, somebody from TMZ, got my cell phone, and uh, said, uh, we have video of people drowning a dog on your set. Do you have a comment? And I didn't. Uh, I said, let me see what's going on. And then I, I will tell you a couple of things. The first is first has to do with what I saw. What I saw was a dog that didn't want to go in the water. Uh, I didn't see a dog uh, being thrust under, I did, uh, you know, forced into the water. I saw a dog being lowered who didn't want to go. And uh, when I went public with that interpretation, with no other facts available to me, I was so attacked and reviled. And um, I got hate mail, I got death threats uh, from people who said that they knew what they saw. But then uh, uh, I went to Amblin and I watched all the film from that day, they just basically showed, and a lot of it was the camera just running while they were, they were getting ready for the next shot. And what happened was that Hercules, the dog, they called him the water dog because he loved the water. And there's so many shots from that day of Hercules straining to get into that pool. But Hercules had been trained for three days to jump in the pool from this side. And that's where he got treated, and that, you know, they gave him treats. He was really excited about it. Then the director decided, why don't we try it from that side? So they took Hercules around, and they tried to convince Hercules to stand on this platform that was just under the water. So if, you, if you'd had a drone and you were looking from overhead, you would have seen two jets of water making it look like the whole thing is a turbulent river. You would have seen that where Hercules was standing, the water was completely calm, and you would have seen about four inches under the water a platform, and they're trying to lower Hercules onto the platform, and he didn't want anything to do with that. He's like, I know where I get my treats. It's a cross on the other side. <laughs> And so what you see is a dog trying to climb out and say, no, I know what we're doing. Let me do my job. Uh, and, that, and then, of course, it, the film is edited. So you see Hercules. You see this guy dunking him in the water. You see it doesn't work. The, the film jumps to a cut. It was later in the day. And Hercules is down uh, at the, the, outtake, the, 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 the drains of this swimming pool. And the current is pushing up against the drain. And he momentarily goes underwater. So he, he's underwater for exactly four seconds because we have another angle on it. Uh, four seconds, uh, I was unhappy with that. And I, I felt like they should have done a better job. There were two people with scuba gear under the dog. And there were other people in the, the pool. So there were a lot of people to make sure the dog didn't drown. Uh, I don't know if anybody here has a, a dog that likes water, but uh, you know, I grew up with Labradors. We would throw things off the dock. They would jump in, and they would go underwater. Uh, our dog, um, Cammy, would you put a Frisbee in the water. If it sank, she would go down and get it. She'd be underwater for 20 seconds. So a dog can do this and survive. I certainly wouldn't have uh, wanted this to happen, but it wasn't a threat to the dog's life, as was purportedly the case from the video. Should it have happened? I think they could have done a better job. Was the dog harmed? Absolutely not. There was an investigation. The dog wasn't harmed. Some people insist the dog is terrified uh, when it's being lowered and uh, when Hercules is being lowered into the water. I think if you, if you think that's terror, you should see my dog Tucker when we're trying to give him a bath. Uh, but yeah, and it did impact the movie. The movie, uh, we canceled the premiere because uh, we, there was an organization that said that they would uh, show up and protest, and there were threats against the people and threats against, we were going to have puppies for adoption. There were threats against the, the puppies because uh, this is an organization, I won't mention them, but they, they believe dogs should not be adopted. They believe that the dogs should actually be euthanized because uh, if they are with us, they're like slaves, and it's better to be 
I guess, a dead slave. Okay, so I'm sorry to bring down the mood in the room, but that was, that was, uh, that was basically what happened. So the final thing is, you know, I got all these death threats. One of them said, I know where you live. I'm going to come kill you, and I'm going to come kill your kids. And I said, if you're going to come after my kids, two out of three of them, I, I bet on my kids. You know, I, got, I, I got one who's nice, but the other ones are really mean. So I thought that the way that was released in typical kind of tabloid, trashy TV fashion, that it would not have any impact, or as they say, any PR is good PR. I don't think a lot of people who read the book and, and, and know you would believe that, and you could tell it was edited. Uh, but it did obviously had an impact. I was surprised. Uh, yeah, I think it impacted the domestic box office. I think we were trending to hit 100, and we hit 60. Uh, OK. You know, it's just I, I will say that I think that something good came out of it, which is every live action movie made from now on is going to be made with the belief that there's someone there taping it. Because I guarantee you the guy who sold the tape made a lot of money on it. So, so from now on, if they were already trying to do their absolute best, they're going to have to do even better. They're just going to have to. So, and I'm okay with that. Well, was that a dis <clears throat> excuse me a disgruntled person, or do you believe that that person really believed the dog was was in some type of danger? I can't imagine someone standing there with a camera if you really thought the dog was in. If I thought the dog was in danger, I would have been in the pool. And I can't imagine anybody just standing there with a camera taking a, a shot and not doing anything to help a dog if they really thought it was in danger. All right, Dog Master, which is on sale outside those doors, just right there, over there. And that is the book uh, that Bruce did a lot of research on and goes back 30,000 years to the first um, domestication of a wolf and um, fascinating book. At one time you said to me, it's Game of Thrones. We've got a pitch into HBO. And I thought after I read the book, that would be a great series on HBO or any network with dogs. It's the Game of Thrones with dogs, sort of. What's the status? Have you ever tried to get that produced? Uh, we are working really hard. Uh, the, the status is that it's going to be so expensive. I mean, uh, the, the bear, that I, the, the short-faced bear, the one that I was talking about that's the size of an elephant, or these pantheras, the extinct lion of Asia that, that shoulder to shoulder with a man and had paws the size of pie plates, we're not going to be able to find those, so we're going to have to we're going to have to make CGI of all the animals, uh, and uh, that's going to be very expensive to be real. I mean, I just wouldn't want to be associated with uh, something where the animals didn't look real. So, uh, so this is all above my pay grade, but they're out looking for a substantial amount of investment. They certainly we we wrote the pilot. My wife and I wrote the pilot. I'm really proud of it. I think it would be a great. Uh, TV show, and I hope that you are someday a Hollywood executive and you can greenlight that thing. <clears throat> I'll think. I'll think about it. Yeah, you think about that. All right, we have time for one more question, and then uh, think about if anybody out there has a question for Bruce, we'll have uh, someone running around with a microphone. Uh, the Repo Man, the midnight plan of the Repo Man, and then there was a follow-up. Yes, Repo Madness. Repo Madness, set in Kalkaska, Antrim County, Charlevoix County. Fun reads, a little bit of a mystery. By the way, there's a little reincarnation in there, too. Is that a thing with you? Re That's kind of a thing. Yeah. Kind of a thing, reincarnation. Uh, get, can you give us an idea of, uh, you went from fatherhood to the dog books and all that, and thought, I'm going to write a little fun mystery book about Northwest Michigan, about a repo man, which you did at one time. What was the idea behind that? Why did you write that book? Well, when I was a repo man, uh, I, it occurred to me that I was something like a private detective. I was always trying to find people who didn't want to be find, found, or at least find their cars. And that was, so it was a lot of detective work. It was a lot of asking questions. And so I always thought it would make for a really interesting detective story if a repo man had to use his considerable skills uh, <laughs> to locate a murder. Uh, uh, murderer or to solve a mystery and uh, so that's the, the midnight plan of the repo man is the first in the series repo madness is the second it is the story of this guy Ruddy McCann who lives in Kalkaska Michigan and uh, spends a lot of his time in places like Traverse City if you read these books I think you'll really enjoy them you'll recognize a lot of the places I even name restaurants and, and local uh, haunts like that and of course it uh, the the books are kind of funny. I mean, the, the characters are funny. The, the the situations are kind of funny. I think uh, I th I'm really proud of it. I think it's among my best work. 
I have one last question. Uh, those two books, are they on sale here tonight? <laughs> Oddly, yes. Okay, there we go. Well, uh, I want to thank Bruce for uh, coming to Traverse City and for your time. Thank you. And, um, and Bruce's mom, wherever she may be. Monsi Cameron, would you stand up so everybody can see who you are? Oh, there we go. Here she comes. There's mom. Thank you. And also sitting in the same row is uh, former teacher of the year, my sister Amy Cameron. Very proud of her as well. Stand up, Amy. There's Amy. So does anybody have a question for right over there? And Hi, please Bruce. talk close, close to the microphone. Okay. Welcome back to Traverse City. Thank you. It's good, great to be here. Yeah. Um, we're at the table out in the lobby for Michigan Writers, and I wondered with all the people in the audience who want to write and are looking at that, whether it's for leisure or professionally, can you talk about what it's like to write funny? That people often really underestimate how difficult that is, but how you've learned to do that. Um, when uh, a few years ago, well, several years ago, uh, I was uh, shutting the, the door to my van and I shut it on my fingers. Um, that's what it's like to write humor. <laughs> it, uh, you know, I, I actually, I've, I've been on panels where, they, where they've, they've announced, we're gonna teach you how to, write, how to be funny. And I, and I go up there and I say, you're, you either are funny or you're not. It helps to have really dysfunctional parents. <laughs> but, in the, but in the end, uh, it, it, to, you just have to have that in you. And, uh, and there are a lot of people who, uh, I was talking to Dave Barry of all people about this, and Dave Barry uh, kind of vented about what he called so-called humor because he works so hard to lay a joke just right, you know? And I know what that's like to keep rewriting the sentence because it's not quite as funny. It's a funny line, but it's not quite as funny. And then he'll see someone toss out a funny situation. You know, it's, it's funny if you wake up in the morning and your dishwasher ran all night and there's, there's two inches of soapy water in the kitchen, but that's a funny situation. That's not a joke. There's, and you can make funny jokes about that, I suppose, but, and there, a lot of people don't understand the difference. So that would, that would be what I would tell a writer is know the difference between something that is said funny and something that is funny, but it's not, but you haven't written it funny. And then stop writing because I've got enough competition as it is. <laughs> you could read Bruce's autobiography uh, on the website. What's your website? WBruceCameron.com. I've got my autobiography up there. It was Re written by me. For a quick example of humor, any uh, uh, questions for Bruce? Up, upstairs here? Oh, anywhere. Yes, upstairs in the balcony. Hello. Hi. Uh, I've only read A Dog's Purpose, but I was wondering how you decided, you know, there are certain things the dog can know and then certain things you just, the dog has to know in order to be able to narrate the story. How did you go about deciding what would be unknowable to the dog and what would be known? See, we're not taking questions from people who have only bought one book. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> but we do have books on sale in the lobby. <laughs> this was actually really hard to do. I thought, I'm going to write from a dog's point of view. How hard can it be? All I have to do is get into the mind of the dog. And to do that, I did things like I carried a tennis ball around in my mouth. I went over and humped the neighbor's leg. <laughs> I thought, you know, this is, I can get into this, but it was actually really hard. If you think about it, there's so many things that we, can, we consider to be common references, like I waited for 10 minutes. But a dog's not going to wait for 10 minutes. That doesn't know what a minute is. To a dog, 10 minutes might feel like forever. And I found myself unwriting so many references that I made that seemed so you know, a dog will respond to something a human said, and I thought, yeah, but the, do the dog doesn't actually understand what was said. So it was, it was hard. I mean, uh, taking on this thing of writing from the dog's point of view, as I've done, hasn't been my favorite uh, because of how hard it is. So that was only a partial answer, I realized, but you've only bought one book. <laughs> How did you come up with the idea to get the realtor in Ruddy's mind? 
Yeah, so I don't want to give away too much, but in, in the midnight plan of the repo man, what it concerns is uh, a repo man who one day starts to hear a voice in his head. And the voice claims to be not just a voice, but a real person, a real person who had been alive, but who is now murdered. Uh, and he's a, he's, a, he's a former realtor. He doesn't sell so much anymore because he's dead. <laughs> and because uh, uh, I, I just thought it would be so interesting to solve the murder if the murder victim was helping solve the crime. And it's, it's, it becomes quickly more of a why done it than who done it. It becomes more like why would anybody kill this guy? The more you, re, the more you find out about the victim, the less it seems like he would be a murder victim. And that was how I put together Midnight Plan of the Repo Man. In the, in the next book, it's like, what do you do for a sequel? Uh, Ruddy McCann had a very glamorous life ahead of him. He was the star football player in Kalkaska. I know that doesn't sound like much. <laughs> but he, was, he went to Michigan State. He was a, a star football player down there. But then uh, one night in Ironton, uh, he, is, uh, he takes that turn. You know, it's funny. If you're driving in Ironton, before they fixed that ramp, there was a moment where it almost looked like the highway went down to the water instead of going the other way. And he takes that turn wrong, and he's going too fast, and he's had a little bit to drink. And he hits the ramp, and he goes right out into the middle of the channel, and the car sinks. And there was a girl passed out in the back seat and she drowned and he went to prison so when he got out the only job he could get is a bouncer in his sister's bar and for glamour he he repossesses cars mm -hmm. and uh in this in the subsequent uh, book the sequel he starts to figure out that maybe the girl was never in the car and that changes everything but it's how could that possibly be right because she did drown and she was in the car originally so that's the mystery that underpins uh, Repo Madness. It's a great series, and both books <laughs> are not only here, but I've signed them. But but by the way, I will be hanging around, and if you buy a signed copy and you want me to write something in the book, like for Mitzi, I'll love you forever, or whatever, <laughs> tell me, or just come up to me. I'll be sitting, or I don't know where I'll be, but I'll be somewhere where I can do that for you. Okay, we have one over there. So I have a dog that also has suspect DNA that I've had for over 11 years now and I always after I first read your book I imagined what his voice sounds like when you um, were casting the movie and whoever did Bailey's voice is it how you imagine Bailey's voice would be I have to tell you so we, we cast Josh Gad who is a very talented actor and he's done some voiceover work he's not uh, he's not a big star but I think he will be some someday and he is so emotive and I went to see the the screening of a dog's purpose with Josh Gad. So it was the first time I met him. This guy, the credits are rolling, he starts crying. He's crying, he laughs at all the jokes that he told. <laughs> the whole way through, he's emoting with this thing. I th when, I, when I found out it was gonna be Josh Gad as opposed to some other actors who had been floated, uh, I was so thrilled. He's, I thought he was perfectly uh, perfectly capable of capturing the joy of being a dog, of being happy and optimistic all the time, and yet also having this deep love and connection for his, his people. I, I, I thought he did a great job. Th a great question, thank you. Balcony. Hi. Hi. <laughs> so, when you wrote Dogmaster, who's your favorite character to write about? Thank you. Dogmaster has probably the most evil person I have ever envisioned, other than my sister Amy. <laughs> there's, a, there's a woman in the Dogmaster. I, I don't want to give too much away, but if you read this book, you are just going to constantly, constantly be shocked at what a bad person she is. And so that was so delightful to write that person because I could just always go to the darkest, most evil place with her. So thank you, great question. Oh, over here on the left, or our left. Hi, um, have you ever seen the new show on ABC, Downward Dog, and do you think they've stole your idea? Uh, I didn't see it, and yeah, they stole my idea. 
I, I, you know what I think I think that I don't know uh, I didn't see it but I heard about it I read reviews of it and from my reading of the reviews they they made the mistake that's so easy to make which is to to make the voice of the dog too much like the voice of a human I mean I, I guess the dog would say things like oh my god I don't think a, I think a dog would say oh my dog <laughs> so all right well up here uh, on the right and one in the back My son's a future um, bestseller. <laughs> he's 21. He's currently he's not here tonight because he's in London taking two English classes. What advice? Yeah, they, they speak that over there. I understand. <laughs> <laughs> what advice do you have for young people who want, like you, crave, need to be writers? He has a screenwriter soul inside of him, but every internship, every opportunity is unpaid, and, and how does a young person break into this industry? I think being unpaid pretty much describes writers. Uh, my advice would be don't do it. Don't write. Stop. Stop. If you have a writer's soul, go see an exorcist to get it out of there. <laughs> well, you know what? Uh, my The history of my life is that I failed constantly and for many, many years. Nine unpublished books, it didn't happen in nine years because I had a family and a job and all that. So it took me my whole life to fail that much. And uh, I, I don't know that that's a very inspiring story for someone who thinks I'm writing my screenplay and when I'm done I'm going to be a billionaire because I, I just don't think that that happens in any job. I just don't know of any easy job other than being on WTCM in the morning. <laughs> and so I just, uh, so, so the advice I would have, I, the, the sincere, I'll tell you something very sincere. I'd say don't do it the way I did it. Because the way I did it was to think, I want a family, I want children. And then they became teenagers and I didn't want children. <laughs> Uh, you know, I had a car loan and a house and all that kind of stuff. I'd say walk away from all of that, be a true artist, get, you know, a job where you're serving coffee, just barely getting by so you're always hungry and you're always focused on your art. And it'll still be really hard, but at least you'll be doing that instead of what I did, which was to take, you know, I, I had a career. I was working for a small family operation called General Motors. And, uh, and when I left, they went out of business virtually. I mean, they went bankrupt, so hey. There's a lesson there, right? So, I, but I, but my larger point is, is that, that it was just really too hard to keep the, all those all those balls in the air. I wouldn't do that again. Did Did you ever consider uh, bailing on the idea of becoming a writer? I couldn't. Uh, I just couldn't. When I, but here's what happened. When I, I was chasing the market, I was trying to figure out, well, what does the market want from me? So when I wa I thought they wanted international thrillers, I wrote international thrillers, although I'd only been to Canada. Uh, but I based one of them in Nicaragua, which in my telling looks a lot like Canada. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and then finally I decided I'm, I, I can't, uh, I, I, I'm, not, I'm never going to sell a book. I mean, I'm literally never going to sell a book. The next time I write a book, it's going to be for me and me only. So I wrote a book and uh, it was funny. I, it turned out that if I just let my voice be what it wanted to be, that it would be funny. And I sent this, I sent it out to agents, and it's the first time in my life I ever got something back besides a form letter. An agent wrote me back and said, this is really good, but I can't sell it. A first novel cannot be 750 pages long. Can you cut it in half? And I said, no, I wrote it for me. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna do that to my art, to my work. Uh, she said, well, what else do you have? And I said, well, I've got these internet columns I've been doing. And she said, send me those. And I sent them to her. And she said, I, I sent those to the editor at the Rocky Mountain News, and he wants to meet you. And so letting it go, letting it be my voice was how uh, I found my way to uh, being up here on this stage and having books for sale in the lobby. Uh, in the back row there. So. Uh, we all, I saw Dark Purpose one moment. I looked at my dad and I said, I can't watch this anymore. Um, so my question is, what is one of your favorite scenes that you had to cut out due to time restraints? Oh, wow. What is one of, one of, the, one of the scenes that was cut out? Yeah. Um, there was this marvelous scene where I saved orphans from a burning building. <laughs> my performance, they said it was so good they couldn't put it on the screen. All other actors would just stop working. They'd say that we, we've topped it, you know, and they'd cancel the Academy Awards. So, 
Uh, I actually will tell you that uh, I was in a movie and got cut from it. I was, my, my wife is a movie director. She made the movie Muffin Top, A Love Story, which we had one of uh, premiere here in, in Traverse City. Um, and I was in a scene. Uh, I was brilliant. Um, and she cut me from, I got cut from a movie and I was sleeping with a director. <laughs> and the role, I was playing, are you ready for this? I was playing man in a bar. <laughs> I was born to play that role. I have been practicing for it my whole adult life and I get cut. Uh, I'm also in the movie Cook Off, which will be released by Lionsgate this uh, uh, November. Uh, I co-wrote it with Catherine and uh, Wendy McClendon Covey. Uh, it's a hilarious movie. We have all kinds of operational difficulties for it, but I think you're going to see it in theaters uh, this November, certainly on, on uh, Netflix and all those things. So, and I am in that movie playing an ambulance driver, which is another way that I made a living for a while. And I, if I am, I'm just going to say it's the best part of the movie. <laughs> Absolutely. All right, we have another question up here on aisle left. Hi. This is not so much a question as it is a comment. Um, my son Mitchell is too shy <laughs> to speak for himself, but he wanted to tell you thank you so much for writing A Dog's Purpose, because I read it as part of my book club and caved and immediately got a dog <laughs> for the family. <laughs> and he is not a reader, but we are now reading A Dog's Purpose together, and he very quickly volunteered to come with me this evening. What's so, your son's name? Mitchell. You owe me, Mitchell. <laughs> All right, any more questions for Mr. W. Bruce Cameron? We go to the back row over here. Hi, Bruce. I just wanted to thank you for the books. I've got two of your 16. Um, I went to the movie. I've told my wife she can't read my books. She has to buy her own. If she comes here, she can probably get a signed copy of it, which should ensure some royalties coming your way. But seriously, I've owned dogs all my life, and I bought the audiobooks, and I will forever look at my dogs differently. And I thought there may be a moment where I might be without them, but those two books have assured me that they are going to be with me the rest of my life. Thank you. Yeah, I do, uh, I do believe, I do believe that we will see our best friends again. I just, I really, uh, honestly, people ask me, well, do you believe in reincarnation? And I say, I'm open to the idea, but I'm not doing junior high school again. <laughs> but I, but I do think that we might, we might very well see our, our best friends again. And the other thing about that is that, uh, and this, this goes to sort of what, what happened with Mitchell, um, I had a dog die, and then I was like, I'm, I, I'm kind of done. You know, that's so hard. Uh, and then years went by, and we got, four years went by, we got Tucker, and I thought, what was I thinking? Why did I go a moment without this much joy in my life? And I know that Tucker and I are one day going to say goodbye, but I also know that I will never again be without a dog. Here, here. Oh, do not give her a microphone. <laughs> Security. Hi, I'm Bruce's much, much younger sister. Um, it's kind of more of a comment, Bruce, as well as uh, a question. Um, well, I have a list of grievances, so let's, <laughs> let's get down to it. Well, first of all, I just want to say, um, as an English teacher, I had a lot of kids that don't read anymore at all. And so what you didn't really talk about tonight very much was Emery's gift, but which all of my, uh, the teenage boys that I teach, they love that book, all of them. And these are kids that will say, well, I kind of glanced through Charlotte's Web. You know, and they haven't read anything. So they love that book. I just want to put that out there because it's a great book. Also, the comment that I just wanted to see what you thought about this. I know dad loved that book. And 
I miss some, you miss some, but I, I'm just wondering what you think. Why do you think Dad gravitated to that book so much? Thanks. And, and can you give us a quick setup, Emery's Gift, what, what em it is? Emery's Gift is, um, it, 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 you're right, it's, it, I didn't talk about it very much, although it is on sale in the <laughs> lobby. I didn't talk about it very much. It didn't sell as well as A Dog's Purpose. Uh, it has a grizzly bear on the cover, and I didn't know this, but not as many people own grizzly bears <laughs> as own dogs. Uh, but it's, it's the tale of a, of a boy named Charlie. He's in eighth grade, and he, he, this is a long time ago. This is, um, it's, it's important to the book that it was the last year that it was legal to hunt grizzly in the lower 48 states. He lives in uh, Montana, where there are still grizzly bears, although they're very rare there. And um, Charlie's mother has died, and Charlie's father has retreated into a shell of grief and has not been helping his little boy get through this. And the little boy becomes convinced that he has made friends with and can communicate with a grizzly bear that he encounters in the woods. And um, it is a parable. It is a uh, rather deep you can read it on many le levels, and if you want to just read it about a boy and a, and a bear, you can. Uh, although at the end, I promise you, you will not know whether or not there was actually ever a bear. Uh, but the larger thing is, and I think the reason why this connected was, it connects with so many men because uh, uh, junior high school is, well, junior high school is really bad for all of us, isn't it? I mean, come on. and and. Uh, and I could write very convincingly about how confusing and awful it was to be an eighth grade boy because I was a really confused uh, eighth grade boy. Um, so there's that. But I also think my father was a dedicated atheist. Uh, but I think the spiritual message of Emery's gift really touched him. And he was uh, at that, when, it, when the book came out, he was not yet at the end of his life. But we, as we found out later, he only had a few years left with us. And I think, I think the question of mortality was starting to play on his mind a little bit. And I think the, the deep themes of this book included talking about uh, mortality and spirituality and what happens to us and, and what's going on in this universe of ours. Um, these are all questions that are in Emery's gifts. So th thanks for the shout out about that book. I, for a long time, it was my favorite book that I'd ever written. I really think my newest one, A Dog's Way Home, uh, is, is also spiritual, but it's a different kind. It's more about the basic connection between a person and uh, the dog that uh, he loves. Uh, but Emery's gift is spiritual in the, the grand sense of the word. All right, we have another question up front here. Uh, just a brief one. Uh, you have a number of unpublished novels, and uh, even though they're unpublished, are they for sale in the lobby? <laughs> All right, you, you caught me. You, you got me with that one. That's a, I will sell them to you, sir. Uh, thank you. That was funny. That was great. All right, well, you have one up in the balcony. Uh, question for Bruce. Well, I wanted to ask about the nine unpublished novels also. And we I already have a bitter, ma'am. <laughs> I want to know uh, what they're about, and the one that was 750 pages, now that you're established, will somebody actually publish that? So uh, here's the thing about being a writer that, that uh, I believe is true, which is you, you, you have to do what Hemingway did, which is on his way to Paris, he took his first novel and threw it over the rails into the ocean because he knew it wasn't going to be any good. And uh, when you're writing a book, when you're writing your first novel, you think this is the greatest thing ever, and then you, you go back and you read it years later and, and, and you're horrified. That kind of happens with everything that I write, though. I mean, even books of mine that have been very successful, I've gone back and cringed at the mistakes that I see and the problems that I could have fixed. And um, the answer is I'm not interested in publishing any of those books. I uh, ha was in a different place in my life, and they really were mostly thrillers. And, uh, and I love thrillers. I love the genre. Uh, but none of them are funny, and none of them have any heart. Uh, they have a lot of machine guns in them, you know, a lot of stuff like that, but no heart. And uh, I, I, I write 
uh, books, hopefully you get from my books, even if they make you laugh a lot, you get the fact that I'm, I'm trying to write from my heart. I'm trying to open my heart and put it on the page. That wasn't happening back then. That was not where I was headed. So it's a great question. Thank you. But no, I'm, I'm not going to. I may never read them again. If I do, though, it will just be to laugh at myself and how naive I was to think that these were publishable. I know I shouldn't ask this question, but how do you like to be described? As a humor writer, do you mind being called, oh, that's the guy that wrote the dog books? Uh, do, you, do you have a preference? <laughs> Devastatingly handsome. <laughs> uh, remarkably witty. Uh, I pref I, you know, that's a great question, Ron. I'm not actually sure. Uh, I'm not sure that I would have a, a favorite way to be uh, described because what I really like to hear from people is that my book touched them, that it moved them, especially if it moved them to adopt a dog from an animal shelter like the, the Humane Society is here tonight. Um, there are so many dogs who through our negligence, remember the, the, the thesis of the dog master for sale in the lobby is that we, we carved these animals to our will we made the dachshund we we made the shih tzu they didn't they weren't natural i mean we bred dogs for our specific purposes they are entirely reliant on us it's, it's almost impossible for a dog to survive in the wild there's there's almost nothing in america that resembles a a feral dog uh, there are some but it's and they're in packs of course and it's very rare and they're usually around a lot of trash because that's all they can do. They can't really hunt effectively. So we owe it to these animals to uh, support them. They can't fend for themselves. And the reason why we have such a uh, population explosion is that people are not responsibly spaying and neutering their pets when they adopt them. And these dogs are, <laughs> they're very, they are like an eighth grade boy. They're very focused on, on one thing uh, when, they, when they pick up that scent. And, uh, and so we have a lot of dogs being born into the world that have no hope of survival if humans don't step forward and, and, and save them. So I would urge you to consider if you don't have a dog in your life and you've got room for one, go adopt a dog. Go find a dog in a shelter. And by the way, if you go to a shelter, your dog will find you. Ah. All right. Well. I want to thank everybody for being here, and thank you again, Mr. W. Bruce Cameron. Thank you. Woo.